Hi everyone. This this it was going to be update from the machine learning team, but um, this is really the first time I think we've spoken uh, about the machine learning team. So it's really kind of more of an introduction to machine learning um, and the team. Um, I'm Andrew Wilson. I've been working with KDB Tech for slightly more than uh, half the 25 years that KX has been around. Um, and in the last nine months, I've been uh, focused on our new machine learning team. Um, the, the, team uh, the team was set up last summer uh, with a view to uh, centralizing our uh, KX's efforts and investment in machine learning. Um, we have a team mainly comprised of uh, sort of experienced KDB engineers, but we also supplement that with data scientists with real uh, academic and industry expertise um, in machine learning. Um, what we're trying to do um, is a few things, I suppose, first and foremost, to develop machine learning tools and libraries for the, uh, for the KX user base, for all of you guys. Uh, we're giving away free stuff, so you're welcome. Um, <laughs> the second thing is to, I guess, provide support uh, guidance uh, with regards to any machine learning projects uh, that are out there. So any, any things you guys want to do, we're here to help um, in conjunction with uh, Brainpool AI. Now, um, it's worth kind of saying up front, using Q and machine learning or KDB data with machine learning isn't exactly new. Uh, people have been using uh, KDB data to drive machine learning algos for, for a long time. Um, the nature of our database is that they're very uh, data centric and you know, very keen to kind of derive insights from their data sets. Um, particularly in uh, finance, probably one of the uh, early adopters of machine learning in the, in the hunt for alpha and for uh, better trading strategies and more money. But uh, also recently we've had uh, experience of seeing um, sort of risk management, uh, smart, smart hedging, uh, trade surveillance, and general process automation in finance uh, improved uh, you know, markedly by use of ML algorithms. In uh, non-financial applications as well, outside of finance, obviously KDB has grown and we've seen machine learning uh, put to great use there as well um, in retail. Uh, we've had um, EPOS data, uh, hierarchical clustering of EPOS data has been used for uh, range optimization and um, categorization of different customers. Uh, in manufacturing, uh, sensor data uh, put through or used to train rather uh, regression, and, uh, regression and classification algorithms is used in uh, predictive maintenance. And in utilities and telcos, um, time series data coming off nodes in the network has been used for network optimization. What we don't have in KDB and Q is access to the kind of vast universe of machine learning that's been implemented and optimized over the last 20 plus years. Um, by comparison, Python is the number one tool used by machine learning uh, engineers these days. And uh, they have this kind of rich ecosystem of libraries, things like sklearn, xgboost, uh, Theano, PyTorch, TensorFlow, all the big ones I'm sure you've heard of. Um, and two ways we could get there. One, we could clone Nick Sars, and he could uh, <laughs> get a thousand of him, and we could, we could get copies of all his stuff. Um, but not wanting to reinvent the wheel, we decided to go uh, straight to the source and pull those algorithms into KDB using EmbedPy. Um, EmbedPy is uh, used to, I suppose, do the, uh, the machine learning part, but there, there are aspects of KDB that are very much suited to machine learning. I don't want to say that you know, KDB is, is not the most suitable tool for the job, because certain things that we can do, like our uh, Array and time series operations. Q and SQL are the uh, Q and QSQL rather are you know the perfect tools for uh, feature engineering for joining data sets, sampling data sets, aggregating data sets, particularly time series data. Uh, Q streaming analytics capability 
is ideal for um, online training and for real-time prediction with models. And scalability, the fact that KDV uh, can operate on these huge data sets makes it the perfect engine for feeding things like deep neural networks that need you know, enormous amounts of code in order to, uh, you know, to be trained effectively. But with Embed Pi, we get Python inside Q. So having done all that, we can, now, uh, we can now call out to these Python libraries, this rich ecosystem, directly from Q. What Embed Pi does is it allows us to import Python libraries, Python modules, directly into Q, and then call them as callable Q functions, as if they were native Q functions. In the past, if somebody wanted to uh, do machine learning using KDB data using Python, they would have to export the data out of KDB, probably do a CSV file, load it up into Python, and, well, it works, but it's ugly. With embed pi, we can pass Q objects directly to Python uh, functions as arguments, and we get Q data at the back end. So it's, first of all, it's all in one process, so what we have is uh, much more efficient, much less copying, much less data transfer. It's also much more elegant. And when we have Python inside Q, we get access to this world of machine learning that I spoke about. We get the scikit-learn, the XGBoost, and the deep learning platforms as well. For free, on top of that, uh, we get all the visualization tools that Python provides, so things like uh, Matplotlib and, and Seaborn, uh, which are critical in machine learning because they allow you to kind of understand and visualize your data and also analyze your results at the end of the machine learning tasks. The final thing we did was, and you've seen uh, some examples of this already, JupyterQ, which, uh, which is our Q kernel for the Jupyter project. The most important and most famous part of the Jupyter project, of course, is our ability now to create Jupyter notebooks. So we can combine Q code with markdown text and uh, inlined uh, charts and results. We can build up our workflow in the way that uh, data scientists are used to using outside of the uh, outside of the Q universe, I guess. What we're, uh, we're going to release today, um, because we've had a lot of questions since Jupyter Q's come out about different ways to use uh, the product, is a series of notebooks. Um, these notebooks are going up on our, uh, on our GitHub. Uh, they're going to cover, um, as you can see, a range of different uh, algorithms. And they, they go through entire workflows, so from uh, importing libraries manipulating uh, data for machine learning, training algorithms, then making predictions and analyzing and visualizing those results. Um, exactly the same, everything I'm gonna say today, you can take the same, uh, take the same tack. Everything's uh, open source under Apache 2. It's on our GitHub and it's free for, uh, free for all the users, including for you know, full commercial use. The other thing, uh, talking of free stuff, um, the other thing we're releasing today is a complete uh, self-contained machine learning environment that will run inside Docker. Uh, the containers uh, will wrap up uh, Q, Embed Pi, and Jupyter Q, and in fact the notebooks that I just mentioned, um, and they are available directly from the uh, Docker Hub, so you can pull them in from the Docker Hub. Um, in addition uh, to kind of the, the full license, of course, this, the Docker instance will work with uh, your on-demand uh, license. So, you know, you can throw up um, a whole bunch of kind of dynamic uh, Docker instances of Q and, uh, you know, do your machine workload or workflow rather that way. Um, in terms of future free stuff, um, our our approach will be uh, over the kind of coming months and, and years uh, to build upon these kind of core tools, Embed Pi, Jupyter Q, etc., to release a series of libraries uh, related to machine learning out into the Q community. Um, again, they're going to be free. They're going to be open source Apache 2. They'll go up on our GitHub, and uh, you're welcome to use them. We're going to put them up there as soon as they're written. The, um, they're going to be documented as well, hopefully, you know, to a professional standard and maintained and supported by us, but comments always welcome, positive comments anyway. Um, <laughs> the sorts of things that these are going to cover is, uh, first of all, say the, the feature engineering piece. So uh, 
common, common tasks that you would use in terms of manipulating the data ahead of a, uh, putting them into a machine learning algorithm, particularly time series data. So we implement things like wavelets that are common um, on time series data. We're going to create um, standard APIs for calling machine learning algorithms and also, I suppose, what you call more Q-esque APIs as opposed to the, the kind of more Pythonic APIs that exist at the moment. Um, and also tools to analyze, uh, validate, visualize, visualize rather those results um, after the fact. The first such library um, that we're going to release uh, will be releasing today, which is a uh, natural language processing library. This uh, uses some of the work we've done and also builds on a lot of the work that was done by our, our, um, by our lab uh, department, our R&D department in uh, Ottawa, particularly work by uh, Ben Jeffrey. Um, the NLP library, again, via embed Pi under the hood is using Python's Spacey library. And Spacey uh, does all of the kind of ripping up the data for us. Uh, Taking the, taking the text data and getting it into the kind of format that Q, Q enjoys and Q can deal with efficiently, so dictionaries and lists. Uh, once we got the data in that format via Spacey, we can then use native Q algorithms to do higher level uh, natural language processing tasks, things like identifying keywords within the data, um, sentiment analysis, which I'm sure plenty of people are interested in, and also clustering um, within documents and kind of sub-core pi to find uh, documents that are uh, kind of related. Now, uh, I don't think I'm in any danger of getting kicked off the stage anytime soon, so I have time for a demo. Okay. How does that look on stage? All good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give a demo of the NLP library again. Um, the, it's actually this this library, in addition to another one of the uh, kind of example notebooks, is uh, going on the GitHub today. So you can kind of feel free to kind of take it apart and play with it. I'm going to use a pretty simple example here. That should give you the gist of the kinds of things you can do and where kind of Python and Q work really well together. First thing I've done there is loaded the library, which you know you can kind of see it's got parser, sentiment analysis, date and time pieces, and then some clustering algorithms. I'll load the data set next. I originally wanted to load in sort of the Bible and the Quran and do some sort of comparison, but uh, was advised against it. Um, staying away from anything by Salman Rushdie too, so uh, instead I will uh, we'll play it safe and we'll go with uh, go with the classic Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or Philosopher's Stone as it was known to me. Um, we're just loading in raw uh, ASCII or Unicode text here. First thing I'll do, I'll split the uh, I'll split the text um, again, just using Q at the moment, into uh, different chapters. So now what we have is. Uh, Instead of a single block of text, we've got one block of text for each chapter, and we got uh, just displaying here using JupyterQ, uh, first part of chapter one. I'll try and stay away from any Harry Potter specific jokes here because I'm assuming not everybody has read it. Um, the next thing I'll do, uh, this is where we're calling out the Python here, so I'm going to import a parser from uh, Spacey. Um, you can see the first argument there is en, that's because the text is in English. Um, after that, I'm uh, listing the various things that I want to do with the, uh, with the data, with the raw data. So I want to tokenize it, lemmatize it, get the, the parts of speech, so nouns, pronouns, verbs, etc., etc., um, and also split it up into a uh, sentence so I can analyze sentences uh, separately. You can see there I've, uh, I've gone for a port. I'm going to listen on port 4321 so we can go old school here because uh, you can't beat the browser for looking at very wide tables. Um, and here we can kind of see what we've done. So we got the raw text, but then we have a tokenized version of the text, a lemmatized version of the text, which means we kind of take every word and go to its stem word. So run and ran, for example, you know, get mapped to the same word. Uh, these are the parts of speech. Um, we have a few options here, but you know it, they amount to something very similar. So we're just... Uh, splitting up the nouns and the, uh, the proper nouns and 
all the various uh, different parts of the English language. Uh, we are identifying stop words, which are words that are kind of the and and that we might want to ignore from any serious analysis. And then we also identify where each sentence starts uh, within the tokenized verse, and we also get where each sentence starts within the characters. If I go back to my... Uh, now, now that we've uh, kind of done that, that, that boring work that we use Python for, we can use Q for the fun stuff. So uh, the first thing I'll do is I'll pull out all of the keywords um, from, the, from the, the book, from the novel, using, um, I'm going to exclude Harry from this because, uh, as you'd expect, Harry is, uh, features quite a bit in Harry Potter. Um, running that analysis, we see, hopefully, as we'd expect, uh, the Harry's best friends turn out as the top two keywords in the book. Um, some of his relatives and most of the kind of major cast of characters follow in the top ten. So all good so far. We can use uh, matplotlib then to uh, and another little bit of Q. So hopefully that shows up okay. Let me scan up. To look at the importance of each of those, uh, each of those keywords, and in this case, their characters, to the various chapters of the book. So we can see there that um, in the first few chapters, Ron and Hermione, the blue and orange there, don't really feature at all. Because Harry lives at home. He hasn't gone to Hogwarts yet. So it's his relatives that dominate. And then as we move towards, you know, through... Harry's moving away from the muggles. We, uh, we get the, uh, the, the wizards move up in uh, importance and the, um, the, the muggles move down. And by the end of the book, we have uh, Ron and Hermione as the most important keywords uh, in the book. Another few things we can do um, once we have the data into a more structured format, um, we can pick a word and look for related terms to that word. So we look up Quidditch. What's related to Quidditch? Well, we get match, team, playing, play. For some reason, we get months. I don't know Harry Potter as well as I thought I did. <laughs> Quidditch months apparently is a thing. House, uh, we get cup, we get championship, we get points, and we also pick up uh, Gryffindor and Slytherin. So we're able to find, uh, you know, given one keyword, what are the keywords that are more closely related or most closely related to that? We can also kind of, similar but different, we can look for exact phrases that contain certain terms. So I've gone for professor here because obviously we get a, a nice set of results here. Professor McGonagall, by far the most important, but we get Dumbledore and a bunch of other professors who I forget their names. Snip down the bottom there, poor old Snip. We can obviously... Um, I said earlier we got the we got the kind of sentence structure broken down in our in our corpus table, so we can use that to split the data into individual sentences. Then we can run sentiment analysis on each of those sentences. And if I look at the results of this, what I get is for each sentence in the book, I get the positive, negative, and neutral sentiment as contained within the sentence, and I get a compound or a net effect of those. If I just isolate the positive and negative sent, uh, sentiment, I should be able to identify the top 10 positive sentiment sentences in Harry Potter. And we get things like, it was the best evening of Harry's life, better than winning at Quidditch. That seems like a good one. And Hagrid looked at Harry with warmth and respect blazing in his eyes. Whereas if we sort by the negative sentiment, then we go the other way. Now we get people dying and goblins and what the heck. <laughs> Apparently Harry was shocked to see Hagrid shaking with grief, shaking with grief and remorse. So it's not all roses in a Harry Potter. Jump back to our, uh, jump back to our <coughs> slideshow here. So yeah, that was a that was a quick demo of what we can do with the NLP library. But you know, I'm sure you can see that we can extrapolate that to more serious topics if such a thing were possible. Um, and also, of course, to uh, different types of data rather than chapters in Harry Potter. So we can look at things like emails. We can look at things like uh, IMs, tweets, uh, legal documents. You know, you pick your use case. Um, I'll finish off by just kind of repeating something I said at the start that. Um, Hopefully you enjoy all that, you know, free stuff and comments welcome. Please, uh, please do uh, let us know if you have any problems or if you have any, uh, 
any improvements that you'd like to suggest, but um, we're also here you know, to get involved with whatever projects you guys are running, uh, be they using these tools or uh, you know, maybe using the raw tools in ways that um, we hadn't thought of. We want to get involved. Um, we've got the resources for it. Uh, we especially, you know, with Alan, the Brainpool guys, uh, we have a, a, a serious um, kind of, I'm going to say pool of brains, but I feel like I'm stealing your line there. We, we, we've got serious uh, kind of machine learning uh, resources here. Uh, so yeah, uh, we got a, a table up the, uh, the south side of the building. Um, I know a few of you have already been over, but yeah, feel free to come over and uh, meet some of the other members of the team and uh, yeah, ask any questions you have or just see some cool demos. Thanks.